Welcome to Directly Correct, a people in this podcast with Colin Scott. Today's guest, Harold Goldstein and Charles Sherbaum, professors at Baruch College. Thanks to our sponsors, Lightcast. The world is full of talent data, but more data can lead to more questions, uncertainty, and stagnation as organizations sift through it to figure out what's fact from what's fiction. Lightcast's talent intelligence platform answers your most difficult workforce questions to drive meaningful business results. With more than 20 years of experience as MC and Burning Glass, Lightcast accelerates your work, bringing together hundreds of billions of vetted, constantly updated data points and incredible insights to drive strategic talent decisions. Your organization can tap into the deepest open repository of skills, supply and demand data in the world to transform your hunches into a skills-based future for your organization. Lightcast's flexible solution, used by 67 of the Fortune 100, can integrate your own data, be guided by in-house talent experts, and give you the tools and confidence to explore it for yourself. To learn more, book a demo at lightcast.io. All opinions are our own and do not reflect those of any other organization. You know, you know the other thing I've been following? Um, I just, I, I'm like obsessed with it now, to be honest with you. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with the idea of it, but I refuse to research it closely enough to know the true facts of the situation because I have this story in my mind and I don't want this story to get overruled. So there, the professor lady from Harvard, right, who we've talked about on the podcast before, who was a, uh, like, uh, I think she's an economist, but she did like research on like telling lies and like lie detection and stuff. And then no, I, I, I don't recall like, this. I don't recall this. Okay, well, so I'll, I'll the the rundown was, and again, I'm obsessed with it, but also have poorly researched it. That that's fine. Yeah, it showed that some of her research didn't stand up to replication. Right, so she was okay. like one of these people, and so it, the irony of it was, professor who ta- does research on lying lied about their research. Right, the story writes <laughs> it itself. Okay, so yeah, I'm in love with it. Um. Fast forward, I met the person who actually uncovered the research, right? They're actually a listener to our podcast. Um, been trying desperately to get them on the podcast. They won't come. They don't want to talk about it. I'm like, whatever. But new revelation, not only did the professor uh, like um, fabricate their research, they also plagiarized. <laughs> so... They plagiarized oh, yeah. a bunch of their research after they fabricated it. So it's like, you can't write, you can't do experiments. <laughs> you can't do anything. Well, like, in for a penny, in for a pound, right? Like, why, why stop at just uh, fabricating data? I mean, like, let's just go the full monitor. So the, the, it's just so funny to me. It's like, what are you good at? <laughs> like, everything you did was, like, basically a lie. You well, know, it's, like, it's, it's kind of like uh, he doth protest too much, right? Like there's something going on if you're talking about this that much, right? There's, exactly. there's something that is really deep seated in you. I, I think it's the same reason that a lot of people go into, say, like counseling psych, mm-hmm. right? They're trying to fix themselves or they're trying to fix someone next to them, right? There's a reason why you go into this field and study the certain topics you do. It, it, it's so true. I mean, I think a lot of people... I mean, I feel like it's almost a cliche now that IOs generally started out in like counseling or clinical and then realized it wasn't for them and then become IOs because you can get paid more to do it and you work with sane people, presumably Um, like that. It's it's so common. It's a cliche. And I know I've fallen guilty of that. I think you have as well, sort of. So, yeah, like absolutely. (laughs) I, I would love to do like an. I don't even know if you could pull it off. Like some sort of like office archetype. <laughs> Maybe for the next Colin Scott, we'll try to find like the niche office archetypes that pop up in your life. You know, I don't know, like the 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 personality hire, the, the guy that really can't seem to do anything, but like he's a great dude. So you <laughs> run him around, you know? You're like, all right. When I, I think about those things, I love the idea, by the way. I think about those things as like, can you really identify that person using like a personality quiz? Like, could you find Dwight Schrute, you know, in a personality quiz? Is that a personality? Car- you know, you used archetype. Is it a personality type? I, I got to think. I got to think as IOs, if we put on our thinking cap and we really pursued it, we would. Right? Like, maybe maybe I'm being... Um, I think, I think you can humor. make the argument. Not only we would, we should. Why aren't we doing mm. this? <laughs> like, why haven't we found the, you know, the office 
personality validated construct measure to which office character are you, but it's not just one of these bullshit quizzes. Like it's a real thing. I, I've mentioned this before, but hell, if anyone out there wants to team up, I'm all game because I'm trying to figure it out. But essentially trying to identify, uh, in sports, you call him a glue guy, right? He's not the mm-hmm. best, well, we basketball. he's not the best rebounder, not the best defender, not the best shooter, whatever. And ostensibly they're serviceable, but they keep the team together. If that guy is off the court, the place goes to shambles, right? And how do you find that guy? Can you do it with network analytics? Is it a personality type? Is it, I don't know. Is it team? I don't know. It, it's not just a central hub in a network. It's not well, that. It's something I, else. I've had the same thought, and I bet you you've actually probably done some research into this, but um, is a glue guy the same in different organizations or different teams, right? Is it the same set of characteristics that make someone gluey? Or yeah. is it like, are they just truly like this, this uh, kind of ephemeral type person that only exists in this one circumstance. E- even just like talking it out this much is already added a lot of nuance to it. Cause like, I, I think of like, just like very quickly, a, a team of uh, salespeople versus a team of uh, tech, tech, high, high tech DEs. And their personalities are so different that the glue guys got to be different. Right. I, I got to believe that. Yeah. Well, I see Charles is here. Do you have any thoughts on what constitutes a glue guy when it comes to team sports? Oof. I mean, obviously, personality is big, right? Somebody yeah. that can kind of draw everybody in, is well respected. You know, maybe not the best player necessarily on the team, but is one that everybody kind of looks to as a leader that gets them, you know, the guy who's always at the center, right? You watch, you guys watch Hard Knocks? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the guy who's always at the middle in the beginner where they're like, you know, one, two, three team, that's like the glue guy that I think about. Harold might see it differently. Were you describing me, Charles? Uh, (laughs) I was saying you're the you're the glue guy. You know, you're like the Jerry. I just I I didn't want to interrupt you. You're the Jerry or the John. (laughs) It's not about the X's and the O's. It's the Jimmy's and the Joe's, right? That's right. (laughs) Funny enough, I said that to my boss this week. He'd never heard it before. I thought it was strange. <laughs> well, so so l- l- let's dig into this, right? Scott, when you said a-, a glue guy, was that the same kind of person that Charles described? Because to me, I think what he described was a little different than what you did. No, I, th- I think we described it in very similar terms. And obviously, okay. it's, like, it's an ephemeral sort of uh, definition we have here. But like once again, not necessarily the best player, not the greatest scorer, not the greatest rebounder. But like, if you think about like in hockey, I got like plus minus, like when he's off the ice, things goes to shit. Right. But when he's there, the team stays together or like the, the, the culture's there on like a football team, 11 people on the team or 52 man roster, 88 college. Right. They keep the team together. Somehow their presence is there. And like, that is like the special ingredient that I'd love to find. Network analytics, personality, not sure. Scott's going to be a millionaire once he figures this out. You know, he's, he's going to do it. Though. I don't know. I might say a billionaire. Yeah. Yeah, true. <laughs> if you um, could find the secret sauce to teams, right, and that, what makes that magic happen, yes, absolutely. Well, similar to Scott having a curiosity around a glue guy, I've had a curiosity about the concept of, you know, with NFL quarterbacks, and I feel like, Of anyone on earth, we've got the two people that we could actually get to answer this question, which is what makes the game slow down? So you always hear like, you know, the more tenured quarterbacks, they get better and the game slows down for them. And it's like, what what on earth does that mean? Because obviously time is a constant. It doesn't change. (laughs) Right. And so what like what makes the game slow down? And, and it do, is there any research behind this that, that you guys have done or other people have done in this space? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And certainly, uh, I like that as a description of what's occurring. Um, you know, I think it's multiple things. I mean, on the one hand, we've certainly found a strong prediction or correlation between aspects of intelligence and performance. 
So I think there is something to how you process information, how you see the field, um, and it does predict outcomes. Uh, so I think that that's key. I think there are certain aspects of performance, like that ability to see an ambiguity when things are a bit unclear, still being able to make good decisions and pick up on cues. Um, that probably plays out in the way you're describing that. So most people call that what the red zone. You know, you're down in the red zone. How do things see? How do you see things? Mm -hmm. Do you become confused? Uh, and certainly the defense is trying to confuse you. But I do think that there is this horsepower aspect of intelligence that plays out there. The second part would be experience, right? I mean, meaning yeah, the more absolutely. you've seen the things, uh, the more you've seen it, the more you can kind of rely on your experience. So I think it's both um, would be my take, at least. That's probably okay, a piece okay. of Oh, I'm sorry, Charles, please. I was going to say, it's probably a piece of like personality from like stress tolerance and that over time with that experience and your horsepower, it just things don't seem to phase you anymore, right? You become more resilient to, yeah, I might get sacked. Yeah. But if I slow it down, I might make the pass as well. I, I think that's an, it's a great point by Charles. One of the things that we needed to do was blend like how you react to stress with how you make decisions. You know, looking at them in isolation wasn't going to help, but by blending them together. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys we worked with, Ken Yusko, who helped build the test and, and is our partner on all of this, he's down at University of Maryland on the faculty. Um, he did a lot of work to blend our personality measures with our cognitive measures to predict those kinds of outcomes. Um, and we called the factor decisions under stress. Uh, and obviously, it's one of the most critical things that predicts success for quarterbacks. I mean, I've heard like F1 drivers talk about the same thing. Like they get behind the wheel and like the, the their, their depth perception becomes like very precise. Their, their their speed and like their you know ability to like navigate becomes like everything slows down, right? And like to your other point about getting sacked, like what Tyson said, like everyone has a plan until they get hit, right? And that's the people that can rise above. That once they get smacked, they can actually go ahead. But like you you, t you talk about intelligence, like are, are we talking about like fluid intelligence? Uh, obviously, probably not. I mean, it crystallized in some respects, right? But what 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 is most predictive in these sort of um, in the sports contexts or the NFL? Yeah, I mean, I do think fluid. That notion of in fluid is where we're aimed at. Um, mm -hmm. We try and multi-dimensionalize aspects of that. Uh, so maybe that goes in a little different way than how the field has gone in the past. But we're trying to pick up on new nuances of how intelligence manifests in that particular job. Um, and so that would be seeing things in ambiguity, um, understanding the complexity of certain situations, um, understanding yeah. specific direct linear patterns that you need to follow, uh, picking up on errors and cues around errors. So I think it's a really complex, you know, it's such a complex construct. Intelligent. I mean, things you would see on the football field, right? Right. Absolutely. And the kinds of inputs they're getting and how they piece them together. Um, you know, I think we've done a little bit of a disservice in the field of trying to understand intelligence because we make it in some ways a little simplistic, yet it's one of the most exciting constructs that human beings have. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. And like, but below, like, say, fluid and crystallized, you're talking about the Cattell Horn Carroll model, where like we, we talk about the GF and GC, but like, what well, there's like sensory motor and like memory and all these other like forms of intelligence, which are equally valid well not equally valid but definitely relate to overall performance right yeah absolutely i mean i think carol what i love about carol is that at least it shows the multi-dimensionality yeah we could think about well how do those manifest in certain kinds of work situations with what the work requirements are asking you to do um i'm not sure we've tapped into all of them and I don't know if we've measured them as well as we need to. I mean, maybe that's, you know, something that that is problematic about uh, how we've approached intelligence. I, I think we've already like just kind of like jumped in too quickly, right? Like, what 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 are you guys up to? And like, we're already like into the sports. Yeah. There's like big old sports well, nerds, but let let me tee them up. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I am so thrilled that we're getting to talk to you, Harold, and you, Charles, because what. What our listeners probably don't know is the NFL before the draft every year is now assessing all of its players using different 
psychological constructs. And the two people who put that together are on our podcast right now. That to me is freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. And so can you guys tell us what exactly is going on before the NFL draft? Because it's coming in a few weeks. This is so relevant. And how did you get into that space? And what what are what what are players being assessed upon? And maybe we, we we can even get to share some of the data that you all have collected over time from the assessment that you've done. But I, I'd like you guys to just tee us up first because uh, this is fantastic work. I'll let you tell the story, Harold, because that's you're a good origin story sort of guy. So <laughs> that's just because I'm older. <laughs> um. You got more stories. Yeah, no, we, we appreciate getting the chance to talk about it. It's been really exciting work for us. Um, so uh, back in 2012, um, a guy named Cyrus Mary, uh, he's a civil rights lawyer out of Washington, D.C. He was involved in the Coca-Cola case around uh, discrimination, the Texaco case. So some of the biggest cases in our field about discrimination, he was involved in those. Um, we had worked on him in a, with an, in a number of consent decree situations, trying to build solutions for various organizations uh, using IO uh, techniques. Um, he also does a ton of work with the NFL. So uh, him and Johnny Cochran, who I guess is kind of back in the news uh, as of yesterday, um, him and Johnny Cochran worked with the NFL on uh, what's called the Rooney Rule, which was the notion of having a diverse candidate slate uh, as a as a kind of diversity technique for trying to um, hire more diverse coaches, particularly in the NFL. Um, so he knew of our work from some of the legal cases we had been involved in uh, and asked us to come talk to the NFL about how we measure intelligence. Um, the NFL was interested in, they were in this mode of elevate the game around that area. So they wanted to get more in-depth psychological assessment as another key area to measure about players that they figured would predict success. So he was the one who brought us, brought us in to present to the NFL and the NFL kind of embraced the idea of expanding the assessment into intelligence and eventually into other uh, important characteristics. They were already running the uh, combine at this point, so obviously they're they're already used to uh, measuring all sorts of and like you, you talk about like high stakes decisions, right? The the value of a first round top five pick is far different than uh, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, right? Absolutely, definitely high stakes decisions. Absolutely, so they were. Uh, they were kind of focused on getting more data. I mean, it's in, in this time of analytics, as you all know, um, at some of the places we presented at the initially wasn't PSYOP or anything like that, but it was the MIT uh, Sloan Sports Conference mm -hmm. talking about integrating measures of psychological assessment as part of the data that would be used when they do things like Moneyball and try and predict outcomes. So um, the NFL was you know, had always had used the Wonderlic, I think, since the 70s, Charles, yeah. is that right? Yeah, that was um, Tom Landry when he uh, first put in the combine in place. That was kind of something that's been part of its DNA since the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. So they were just in a mode where maybe we could augment the Wonderlic and build in some other measures. Um, and that's why they approached us back in 2012. We went in and presented to them. Ken Yusko and I uh, went in and presented to them. Um, and they said, yeah, let's build a test. Uh, which was kind of cool because we knew we'd get to do job analysis, which meant we got to talk, <laughs> talk to players and GMs and coaches. And so that was kind of one of the most fun job analysis we got to ever do. So <laughs> no, said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> like the most I don't know. in this now. context though right like <laughs> yeah. going in and watching all the football games right i mean this is this isn't watching a cashier right yeah. <laughs> what yeah. what's interesting about it is you basically took the same techniques that you'd use for traditional selection and you just applied it to a new situation. So could, I mean, for those who, who aren't familiar with what you do to select player or select, you know, traditional workers more effectively, what did you guys do with the NFL to, to get the kind of construct validation that you were looking for here? Yeah, I think Charles. Yeah. One of the things that was really interesting is that 
validation was top of their mind. And you think about anybody mm -hmm. who's worked in the talent management or talent acquisition space, you're often struggling to get companies to invest in doing a validation. For them, it was a requirement because they're only going to invest in things that work. And the other thing is that they were so, you know, oftentimes there's negative stereotypes as it relates to sports. They were so insightful and thoughtful. As Harold mentioned, it started with an intelligence test. And quickly they're like, well, what about these other things like leadership, teamwork, resilience, preparation, the things that make somebody really great. And so this really quickly ballooned from just looking at intelligence to looking very comprehensively at a whole person uh, as a player. But I think what was you know interesting from our perspective, you think about a lot of entry level jobs, right? We'll give standardized assessments. We'll use those standardized assessments in a variety of different methods of use to determine who to hire. Um, but this is the kind of stakes that you usually don't have at the entry level. So this would be like hiring an executive where if you make yeah. a bad decision, there's real consequences, but we generally can't do the types of IO psychology techniques for those jobs because there's so few people. Cole Breedley brought up the uh, the quadrants. Yeah. There. What, what, what were these? Cognitive ability, personality. What else was it, Cole? Or Harold or Charles. It's, it's learning <laughs> styles. You think we got them memorized, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, they were very focused on learning because um, there's a lot of restrictions around how much time they can have the players on the field uh, during training camp. You know, so there was a yeah. lot going on around that and. They really wanted to focus in on well, how do these how do these guys learn? You know, how can we get them quickly up to speed uh, to be ready to play? So they focused on that. They wanted to know what drove them. So that was the needs, uh, which was probably our least in depth and um, assessment was around needs. It kind of reminded us we need to think about that with more depth. Uh, as we said, we started with intelligence, um, and uh, I think almost every interview they. They started by saying, you know, well, I'm just a dumb jock, but here's what I think. And then they would just <laughs> give a manifesto. I mean, it was just incredible. Their insight of these GMs and coaches and player personnel people, they just see this stuff with such in-depth resolution that we were just scribbling notes constantly. Really amazing. Well, it makes sense that learning plays such a role here. I mean, most jobs the percentage of time that you are doing learning versus performing, you know, maybe it's 5% learning, 95% performing. Whereas the NFL, it's probably the opposite where 95% of your time is in practice and only 5% of your time is executing in a real game. And so I could see why this, this has to be one of the key things that's assessed to try to determine effectiveness in, in the NFL. So th yeah. this is fascinating. It, it was incredible. So uh, Charles and I and Kenny and uh, Elliot Larson, who's on our team, we spent weeks in training camp with them. And we would sit in these, you know, in the player, uh, in the various player meetings mm -hmm. and watch them cutting through swaths of data uh, on how, different plays and what they needed to do and how they needed to configure things on the field. And, you know, we've all watched football forever. And it was like an alien language. I mean, mm -hmm. we just had no conceptualization of the sheer amount of things these guys needed to learn. It was really amazing. Just just look at like a wide receiver's uh, a chart, right? Like the, you go up the ladder and like if the defender does this, I, do, I go to the left. If they do something else, I go to the right. And they have to be on the same page as the quarterback and seeing the same things. Yeah. It, incredibly cognitively demanding right like we don't have this sort of coordination in any sort of business setting not not to that degree anyway no you're you're absolutely right and what we found is that our intelligence measures predict across the board for all the positions now they do predict more for certain positions than others but they predict across the board and in particular our measures around visual processing yeah just cut across everything it's it's amazing um doesn't matter what position you are, you've got to be able to process that visual information in a, in a meaningful way. So I, I would, I would, I would hypothesize that a running back would be like the purest position because like it's all vision, speed, power, give me the ball. I run. It's, 
you're you're totally you you probably know more about football than us because the running back um was the one where we didn't predict as well except for that visual yeah you know that visual insight was critical for them same thing with wideouts it was they, those are the hardest for us to predict from an intelligence standpoint but that visual processing is so powerful for them well from a technical standpoint how do you assess the visual components versus the psychological components yeah and so we've done it a couple ways so you you know thinking back you talked about the c we earlier talked about the chc model and so we had some you know in the intelligence component of it we have a lot of visual items that require them to work with new information understand if then type relationships that we were just talking about and then we've kind of evolved so the key with working with the nfl is that we have to be constantly chasing you know the next innovation to make sure that we're helping them elevate the game through the assessment yeah. so we move to introducing a lot of dynamic type items so things are moving on the screen that they need to track um, and now we've evolved a little further and we've started implementing eye tracking so we can actually look at how they're visually processing different types of stimuli you know that's in their visual field so you know we've gone from a very traditional more static which worked really well but uh, are, are nfl players like super abnormally acute like do they have super abnormal acuity in this space compared to like a normal human being or are they within like the normal bounds like I, I'd just be so curious if like you're a world-class athlete and you have world-class vision, you know, that you're unstoppable mm. probably at a certain point. Yeah. I mean, I, that's a great question. They, they definitely are strong in it, but they definitely vary in it. Right. And so the one thing that we found most interesting about this was that trying to make predictions is the intersection of three human domains, which is intelligence, personality, and then the one that we don't know as well, which is physical. And it really is an intersection. So, you know, you might have, and the other thing is different combinations lead to success. So you might have stronger physical capabilities, maybe less visual processing capabilities, strong personality drive, and that leads to success while somebody else might have a different configuration of capabilities. Um, and that, that made this challenging to try and really understand, but it's also reflects reality, probably reflects reality when trying to predict other jobs too. And we just haven't really approached it that way. You know? I, I think, I think I stepped on you earlier, Harold, uh, like what position is the most easily predicted from these cognitive measures? I have an idea. I have an idea besides so what, quarterback, besides quarterback. What do you think it is? Besides quarterback, I'm going to guess it's the center because like they are commanding the line and the blocking schemes. See, I was going to say the kicker. <laughs> <laughs> See ball, the, kick ball. The yeah. kickers, we don't make any statements around the kickers. No. We do we do test them, but so far we haven't really looked at their data. I, ironically, um, the one that has the most psychological <laughs> minutiae going on, right? Yeah. But you, um, yeah. So, again, you would have been very helpful on our team. The O-line in general has very strong prediction yeah. off of our assessment. Uh, battery uh quarterbacks tight ends those three positions are particularly strong but uh other areas on the defense it also we have pretty good predictions so d-line is one that that the intelligence factor predicts pretty well on so which which i think people would not would not have thought would be the yeah case. so and is think, there any difference between like a end and a tackle on the d-line like i would think an end would probably have more like a tackle just clogs up space a lot of times, <laughs> whereas the ends, you know, they have more flexibility in terms of what they're doing. Is is there differential prediction amongst the D-line? You guys are so on the right target. The only problem we have, as Charles tells me every time I say, let's do this, is sample size. So we got, mm -hmm. we have 5,000, oh, what, 5,000 players yeah. tested at this point for the NFL. And the problem is when you break it down by sub position, you know, the samples drop a lot so we're starting to see some patterns in there but yeah. none that we feel as confident about and we try to be conservative matter of fact like uh we measured mental toughness starting out in 2013 uh but we never gave the scores till 2016 i think because we were we just weren't happy with the validity of prediction and we you know so we just kept leaving it blank and now you know we just 
we want to be a bit conservative here because these guys, you know, their, their jobs are on the line when they use our data. So, you know, we, we want to try and give them the best that we can. Well, three years is also the average lifespan of an NFL player too, right? So like it's an entire life cycle there. I mean, with that said, what, what kind of criteria are we looking at here? I mean, you, you could you could break your leg and your season could be over in training camp, right? Uh, also, well, I mean, that could happen anyway. I could get hit by a bus today too, you know. All, yeah. all sorts of things could happen. But NFL, obviously, it's the longer you play, you're going to get hurt. Charles, you got to contribute what Ken talks about with that. Uh, measurable. I'm going to, I'm going to channel, channel my inner Ken Yasko. So the one thing that's really been interesting for us is just the whole host of criteria available to us. You know, I mean, I think anybody who watches sports has seen like next gen stats and yeah. all of the um, real in depth. But what's interesting where we started was we did something in the NFL. They're, they're so used to working with objective data. We started with more traditional performance data where we would at the end of the season, we would send the clubs confidential evaluations where they would describe the development of the player over the course of the year and would really evaluate them in the dimensions we measure on the test. So that was one starting point for us because, you know, we can look at all the stats in the world, but if the team doesn't see them as a leader, you know, are they a, a leader? But then we've moved into lots of on the field metrics. We just were completing a study where we've gone and collected all the college data from all the players in our database. So we're looking you know, kind of building out the entire space, both predictor and criterion. But well, I think the we, thing we, the thing I want to call out here, it, it, uh, for those that are just listening, not watching, we actually have on the screen all yeah. the different criteria that coaches are assessing players on and the correlations to intelligence, personality, and the overall composite. The thing I wanted to call out here, we're not just talking – generically about like oh they did a bunch of assessment and it was there was a cool factor and oh it was so neat to learn these things these are actual scientific mm -hmm. predictions that are being made with real co real coefficients that are showing the relationship to real outcomes in the nfl so like this is this is world-class science using world-class you know researchers i'm just trying to build you guys up you know world-class <laughs> researchers <laughs> to do this work like this is this is as good as it gets as far as I'm concerned in terms of IO psychology being applied in the real world. So I'm just super thrilled that you guys are here. It's we, super thrilling. I love that it boils down to like supervisor ratings, right? Essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. You you got it. Supervisor <laughs> ratings. But I will also say that while I love what you said, Cole, the the coaches at the G well, particularly the GMs, would we started presenting those correlations to them and they were like, I don't really care. What does that yeah. mean? You know, like yeah. what does what does a 0.28 correlation mean to me? You know, and that that really pushed us in terms of trying to translate in it into what does it mean for these guys? Uh, you know, from that standpoint. Well, let me that let me put on my GM hat for a second because again, we're we're not just our psychologists; we're people analytics professionals. When you start to look at correlations like this. And then you have the, because uh, I know we said today, we wouldn't talk about any specific players, right? But sure. these coaches and GMs, they're getting data on each specific player. They can build their own predictive models based on this and mm -hmm. test out the predictions that are made against what they see on the field. So it's not just theoretical 0.28 or 0.40 or whatever the correlation, which for those who aren't familiar, a 0.40 correlation is excellent in the social sciences. Like it's about as good as it gets. And so if you're seeing these type of correlations, you can put them into your own models and test them out in reality and, you know, hire your own data scientists and do this for you. So like these are very actionable insights. It's, it's exactly what they did. And I got to tell you, I, for some reason, you know, back in 2012, 2013, when we started this, you know, when we started working with some of the clubs, just because we're always open to talking to them about the data, um, you know, they were very much at the beginning of some of those analytical departments. I think maybe they were, you know, MLB started it and football was kind of coming in a little later to it. So they were talking about Excel sheets and guys who could run spreadsheets. And now when we talk to clubs, they're doing exactly what you said, Cole. They have in-depth people, statisticians out of Georgia Tech and all these places running incredibly in-depth models on the data. Uh, to, to hopefully use it effectively. Because the one thing we tell them is this is just one assessment. They should be using yeah. all 
They should be using other assessments, other psychological assessments. They should be using their interviews, what their scouts say, everything, and put it in a model to make predictions. Absolutely. Yeah, like I imagine, I imagine for baseball, right? Imagine if you use the same eye tracking techniques to assess catchers on the ability to react in real time to 100 mile an hour pitches, right? Like there's a lot of transferability here that could go to other leagues, but I mean, is NFL the most progressive in this space? Are they the ones that have leaned into this the most? I feel like they have, Charles. I mean, I feel like they had this view of saying we want a league-wide assessment. They also allow other assessments by club. So they want the clubs to be able to do what they want to do. But they said, but let's have some kind of bottom-line assessment across the league. Uh, So they were really forward looking that way. We have spoken to other leagues. They haven't necessarily moved in that direction. So we've ended up working with teams like within the NBA, um, you know, that kind of approach. Mm -hmm. But um, every every sports league has their own approach to it. Uh, We've been impressed by the NFL's approach. That's for sure. Definitely. And one of the things that's been really interesting in that approach is it's not just selection, but development. So once we use our data that once a team drafts a player we then send them a development report to help them facilitate the development quickly on board that player um you know when you guys were talking a little earlier about how much they learn i mean they have they call it install like you're basically downloading software into the player but they have to do that every single week learn brand new systems uh brand new schemes things are always changing and so for them, it's not only making sure they get the right person, but then how do they get the best out of them quickly? Uh, you guys have developed a, a great system here to select NFL players and train them up, et cetera. Can you tell me why the Cowboys don't use this? No comment. No comment. You want to like move on to the confusion matrix? Yeah, let, let's do some confusion matrix. The Confusion Matrix. Well, what, you, what you got for us today, Scott? What do I got? Let's do a little research roulette. How about that? Ooh. All right. This is okay, perfect. So we, we got two academics. We got some fake research. Yeah, on absolutely. So we got three studies. One is real, two are fake. And your, your task is to identify the real one, okay? <laughs> I, I defer to Charles as the actual oh, man. Okay, so this first one is uh, cross. The title is cross species communication. Do plants respond to human pep talks? This is from uh, the Journal of Interspecies Inter. Uh, what is it? Interactional Interspecies Journal. Pardon me. Probably gave that one away. That's not actually it, right? <laughs> or it's a trick. I fall. Or it's a trick. trick I mean, it's very rusy, right? I was um, gonna say I'm excited to read that one. To tell you the truth. <laughs> The second one is uh, uh, a full or empty beer bottle uh, sturdier, pardon me, are full or empty beer bottle sturdier and does it fracture uh, threshold suffice to break the human skull? This is from 2009 from the University of Berm, no journal title. So does a sturdy or full empire, pardon me, a full or empty beer bottle uh, fracture easily on a human skull? And finally, the uh, title is The Societal Impact of Misplaced Grocery Carts from the Social Dynamics and Public Spaces Quarter League. So once again, you have, mm-hmm. do plants respond to human pep talks? Uh, are full or empty beer bottles more likely to shatter on a human skull? Or uh, the societal impacts of misplaced grocery carts? And for you guys sake, I don't know the answer. But I'm saying number two has no way in hell getting through IRB <laughs> unless they did the study in like 1920 or something. That one, that that can't be it. Or or after games for the Premier League, they could be doing yeah. studies there. A yeah, nice yeah, field probably. study. <laughs> what do you guys think? What's the real one? Charles, is maybe the like maybe the carts. I'm thinking the carts. <laughs> There's not like that. That's like the lowest common denominator in you know, like human civilization, right? Like it's purely altruistic sort of behavior, right? There's no reward for you. It's only reward uh-huh. for society. So it's, I don't know. I'm just saying maybe you can include it in the NFL measures. Do you re- return the card or not? Right. I think oh, the actual answer. Oh, it's go, go it's got to be the card just because I know you, Scott. 
I, I'm starting to learn like the ones are the ones that were curious to you that those are the right answers. And so I'm like, it's got to be number three. So, <laughs> so Scott, I'm going to only because you said that I'm going to tell you at the very first combine, I was sitting outside the testing room. And I started to say, watch how the players came out, whether they let the door slam while other other yes. players are still taking the test. So I started I coding this. that data as they came out as a predictor to see if it predicted anything about the players. It didn't, but I'm just saying, we were looking <laughs> to see if players that were more considerate of the other players, you know, in not letting the door slam would have predicted better than our test did. So. See, maybe this, maybe this is the glue guy, right? Like, so the, the guy that go. doesn't walk down the middle of the alley while you're trying to drive down, you, you know, it. you get your car on the grocery store or like the person that just takes too much time at the counter with the register <laughs> lady, right? It's like, come on, man, you're inconveniencing, inconveniencing everybody. <laughs> That's great. Just, just take all these players to the uh, the airport. I, I've said this many times. Like, it puts enough cognitive strain on people that they their, their true colors come out, right? <laughs> it, it, at least you can tell if they're cool or not, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so what's the right answer, Scott? <laughs> the actual right answer is our full or empty beer bottle sturdier and does it fracture uh, threshold suffice no to break way. the human skull. Yeah, uh, I don't have the ability to send this over right now, but. Journal Forensic and Legal Medicine, 2009, uh, Stephen Bollinger. Let's see. The first line is, beer bottles are often used in physical disputes. Bold claim right there. But if the beer bottle breaks, that may give rise to sharp trauma. However, if the uh, bottles remain intact, that may cause blunt injuries in order to investigate these blah, 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 blah. But there you go. That's they must use dummies or something. That can't have been like, <laughs> like uh, let's see. breaking things on people's heads. Here, let, let me let me like quickly scan the abstract. Full bottles broke at 30 J, I guess, joules impact energy. Empty bottles broke at 40 joules. These breaking energies surpassed the minimum fracture threshold of the human uh, neocranium. Uh, beer bottles may therefore fracture the human skull and therefore serve as dangerous instruments instruments in a physical dispute. That's great. So, Love that wonderful? Research. I got to read that one. It's, it's uh, I guess, you know, there was an incident where the guy was swinging his football helmet a couple of years ago at uh, oh, the old Oklahoma State quarterback. I can't remember his name. Ru Ru Rudolph. He got got whacked in the noggin. Yeah. Are, are there any are there any sort like I, I watch probably from start to finish, probably 150, 200 college games a year like wow. And it's not it's it's not a good thing. Trust me, <laughs> it's not a good thing. But like I, I look at all these sort of uh, attributes. Uh, I'm not looking at a critical eye just for pure yeah. entertainment. But are there any sort of attributes that you want to get to these like sort of intangibles that you haven't been able to tap yet? And I'm thinking like football speed or football intelligence. I know you have some of these in these uh, yeah. uh, uh, chart that. Yeah. Cole showed a while ago, but is there anything that you want to tap that you haven't tapped yet? Um, I think the drive stuff we need to go deeper into. Uh, what motivates? What gets? Yeah. What gets them excited? I think it can be good from a coaching standpoint, like how to coach the player. Uh, so I'd like to go deeper there with our measures of it. Um, I think that's a great question. What else should we measure? We did add things over time. So initially, we didn't have like self-control, some of those variables. And we did add those out of our work with the University of Nebraska Athletics. Uh, so interesting. To well, yeah, you brought up like earlier, like Mr. Irrelevant, right? The last pick of the draft. Yeah. Is there any kind of measure for like having a chip on your shoulder, like from a personality standpoint? <laughs> of, like somebody who's got an ax to grind, who really feels like they need to prove themselves. Like the is Rudy, that Rudy measure. Like, yeah. I had a little of that as a Michigan graduate and Brady. <laughs> he was close to last. <laughs> yeah. That's a great, well, there, there you go. There's something we need to measure that, that chip on the shoulder. Again, it doesn't have to be there, but it could be a good driver for somebody. So that, that's a great. <laughs> or, or it could cut both ways. Maybe it's destructive, you know, and, or maybe there's like a Goldilocks zone or something with that. I don't know. These would be yeah. fascinating questions to answer. Brady is another good example of just like adaptability. I mean, the guy changed his style throughout his career. Granted, 
much longer than any other player. I don't, I don't think any other player played as long as him, you know, 23 yeah. years, something like that. But yeah. at, begin, at the beginning, he relied on his physical abilities, and towards the end, it was all technique, timing. Yeah, dude, dude could yeah. barely run at the end. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he was known for running at the beginning either. No. Yeah. So there you go. But he, you're right. He did keep adapting. And when you're in the league that long, you've got to adapt because the teams are changing how they approach things. And the I mean, rules are changing, yeah. right? So and when you draft these, I mean, they're in their young twenties, right? So these are yeah. still individuals who are growing and adapting to their life and what football has meant to them. For a lot of them, football has been the center of their life for so long. And so as they start, you know, going to different domains of their life, how does that change and keep them mm -hmm. focused on the game? It's really interesting from a human development perspective. Yeah. Like, how do you handle all the money? You know, right? Like, just all the fame just thrust <laughs> upon you. Yeah, that's that's another uh, criteria and variable that we need to be predicting is like who's going to blow all their money, the students or something. <laughs> well, Charles Charles said to me the other day, we got to take a closer look at how NIL. Speaking of college, yeah, games, right? how NIL is changing things for yeah. who's going to be successful, right? Well, some of the guys are more lucrative in college than in the NFL, that's which right. is kind of yeah. crazy. I'm yeah. curious though, like obviously Scott and I are sports fans. Were you guys sports fans before you got into this? And did, did this change your fanhood at all? <laughs> it's very different watching at least football. Like, so you might watch over a hundred college games. We usually have like our Sunday ticket up with four games on at a time because mm -hmm. for us, you know, every week's the validation, you know, it, for football, unlike some of the other uh, work organizations, there's multiple discrete events right like each game is important and so if a player doesn't do what we might have predicted they would do and he got drafted you know somebody's looking saying like why those guys are wrong so it's you, you, you're one of the few people that get to play real fantasy football right like we, your predictions we, come true on the tv yeah it's definitely stressful <laughs> from that yeah. standpoint and it definitely kind of negatively impacts our fan experience because everything's about us I mean, for me, Charles, everything's about being right now. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, and I was a diehard fan, but now it's more. I've got, you know, Charles is right. We've got the ticket up, and I've got my computers on my lap, and I'm looking at how did somebody score six years ago on our test, which so it kind of is, there's a negative aspect. Not that I'm trying to complain, because we do really enjoy it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You seem like a guy at the racetrack who's tearing up his cards after the horse loses. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, God, Absolutely. I mortgage the house. It, it also <laughs> stops us from playing fantasy, or at least I keep telling the entire team, including all our graduate students, that they're not allowed to play. I think they just ignore me. But I'm like, I don't want us to be the ones who lose playing that because they're going to say, you have insight into who's supposed to succeed, and you all can't win a fantasy game. So... Uh, I've at least banned myself from playing fantasy. I don't know if Charles is abiding by me. My oh, I'm a, I am abiding. I, you I, don't want to be on the losing side when you're supposed to be an insider. That's right. The dude abides. The yeah. dude abides. Yeah. I, I quit playing fantasy. The, the one thing I will say is anytime we're talking to the clubs, they're all looking at their fantasy stuff. You know, so <laughs> that, that makes me realize that nobody really needs to listen to me on this <laughs> Well, you talk about the plethora of data sources too. So you got like fantasy stats and like what is it? Is it PFF where they rate every player on every play and just yeah. you know, there's just massive amounts of information is published everywhere on these people. Unbelievable amount of data, which opens up that criteria domain. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Took the, the fanatics around this produce so much data. Uh, I mean, our it's our biggest data set and growing. Um, looking at how things relate to PFF, to approximate value, which is another big measure. Um, uh, the, good, the cool thing is we're able to look at how do our top people, how we assess them, do on those kinds of metrics compared to people who we said wouldn't be as strong. So it's great data. I mean, really great data. I suppose you can't give us an early draft preview, right? Like Caleb Williams, yeah. thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> oh dude don't put him in that position. oh no it got real quiet yeah I got it. <laughs> you gotta move on <laughs> uh, as harold pulls out his laptop to see how he does in the in the draft <laughs> no, we, this, is, this is hilarious we we sit on during the draft we sit on a similar zoom our team the four of us 
yeah. sitting there with the data open, watching each team, seeing which teams are following what we said, which ones are ignoring us. So it's it's a uh, it's a lot of fun from that standpoint. I'll, I'll give it in of one. Like I saw Caleb Williams play at OU in a couple of years at USC. Uh, I'm not convinced. The, a lot of hero ball going on there. Not convinced right. that's going to translate. Yeah, yeah. But I'd love to see the stats in a few years, guys. I'd love to see the For sure. We'll do a post-mortem podcast after he flamed <laughs> out. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, are you guys ready to do some nerdery? Let's do it. The nerdery. All right. Where do you well, start? Let's. Uh, why don't we start? Since we've talked about college football a few times, do you want to talk about the impact of college football, one, Scott? Impact of college football. So this is a uh, revisited study from a Oregon study that simply showed that students' academic performance uh, was negatively affected by team wins. But this was related to uh, Clemson University, and they covered football performance from 1982 to 2002. And they, it looked like, a, I read this a couple of days ago, it looked like uh, a regression, but they were partialed out some uh, uh, control variables, et cetera. But the findings essentially show that football record does negatively impact student grades. The effect was more pronounced for female students than male students, which is contrary to the uh, Oregon study. Uh, and the carryover effects of poor grades, uh, th there is a carryover effect of poor grades into the spring semester. Uh, but also the college received more applications um, for, you know, admittance after a good football season. So there's a need to balance these two things out. And I love that they took a shot at Oregon here. They said, well, the reason that the male students didn't have an impact on their grades is because they're going to watch whether we win or lose. Oregon, they're going to watch only when they're winning. <laughs> oh, oh, that's salty. Like, when, and, and just to be clear, this is if the team does better, people perform less well at school. Correct. That's what the Correct. negative correlation is, and I think it, <laughs> I think it makes face valid makes sense, sense that man. when the team is winning, maybe people are partying a little bit more than uh, studying a little bit less than maybe they should. Now, I was curious about the female versus male findings. I would have expected the opposite, but that was really interesting to find. Yeah, I mean, like like I said, they they say that the males are going to watch no matter what in the South because it just means more, right? It just means more in the South. Mm -hmm. Clemson, that's not an SEC school, but yeah, 80, sure. Well, you know, they're ACC. I mean, like, 82 to 2002, they weren't that great either. No, they weren't. <laughs> that was like right when their kind of dynasty started was at yeah, the end of the ramp up. Yeah. 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 I would love to see him do this at Alabama or Ohio State or schools that have just been dominant for so long. Well, yeah. there would be no, there would be no variance yeah. because the number of wins would be <laughs> range restricted. <laughs> Alabama did lose to Louisiana Monroe uh, Saban's first year. That was probably a – Wow. Yeah. That was 2005, a seven, something like that. But it, it, it makes cool. sense. Like you spend all your time like looking at blog posts or uh, you know reading Twitter or, as Cole mentioned, going to the bar. You got to like, get your time in, man. It's your boys. It's interesting. Or girls in this case. Yeah. <laughs> girls are well, negatively impacted too. Yeah. Well, so the – so. I mean, this has nothing to do with those findings, but it does have to do with college sports. So the one place we're doing in-depth work is University of Nebraska. They have like a human performance center there where they look at trying to predict performance and, and develop performance across all these different disciplines. You know, yeah. doctors, psychologists, everybody under the sun. So they brought us in and we built a similar type of assessment uh, for for them that we did at for the NFL. Um, and one of the coolest things we did find was our test predicts football performance on the field as viewed by the coaches and how they're doing. The sample's too small to go with on-field data, but it does predict it. But one of the studies that their internal people did is they went and talked to their nutrition people, the doctors that work with them, the sports psychologists, the academic advisors, and they even pulled like their grade point average. And they showed that the, these core factors that we were measuring predict all of these different things, you know, and it was kind of like a 360 in their life. And it shows that these psychological things that you have 
you know, they're going to impact all aspect of your life. Right. So they were predicting their, you know, their academic viability and whether they showed up for tutoring sessions, all these independent yeah. rhythms of their life. It was, it was really cool. Uh, well, and that's fascinating because what I would have expected as the, the younger a person is, so like high school football, athletic ability can probably outweigh everything else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then in college, you know, more behavioral or psychological data probably starts to play more of a role. And then in the NFL, it may even flip to where the psycho because everyone in the NFL is just a world-class athlete in one way or another. So then it like all the variance associated with that goes away. So it's got to be almost all psychological or some other variable at that point in time. I mean, I, I feel, I feel like that logically would make sense. I think what you're saying is right. I mean, I think it's hard to find that level of minimum competence that you need, but yeah, I, I agree. And we, we uh, Charles, when you and I were speaking, remember a few years ago, we went to talk to Google about lessons learned from the NFL. And one of the things we said to him is probably everybody you hire is bright. Just like you just said, the NFL, probably everybody yeah. that's in the game has physical ability. In some companies, intelligence is kind of that bottom line. And the variance they see in performance is other factors, drive, personality, ability to work with others. So it's really interesting, again, that three different domains of human capability and how they intersect to predict outcomes, you know? Or even just the power of conscientiousness across fields, like the ability yeah. to show up to class, right. do your homework. It showed up in the results earlier. I don't know if you saw yeah. that, but that was one of the highest correlations was uh, you know personality and whether they showed up on time yeah absolutely yeah i love that like this galton lab too it's like everything goes back to francis galton it's just like hey we're gonna measure everything we're gonna figure it out i love it <laughs> <laughs> well let, let's stay on the theme of uh athletics and, and go to our next one cheers versus jeers Cheers versus jeers. So this is not not the best study all, overall, but it's definitely fun, right? I think a so, lot of our studies are not the best study, yeah. but they're fun. <laughs> uh, so this study examined the different types of audience feedback and how they uh, impact individual sports performance. So specifically cheering, jeering, and total silence. So the method, uh, they, they gathered D3 athletes from you know some school and uh, people that played basketball, baseball, uh, in golf and they put them in front of 10 Confederates from a psychology course and they instructed the, uh, Confederates to, uh, yeah, to cheer, jeer or remain silent. It's the first and probably only time I'll ever see the words you suck in a method section. So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, just FYI, but, uh, the results are kind of interesting. So basketball unaffected by any of the conditions, right? Whether you're cheering, jeering or silent. Uh, baseball, baseball pitchers worsened when the audience jeered, but uh, a as compared to whether they were silent or cheering. So they, they got worse when people jeered. Golf, uh, they perform best during silence, but worse during cheering or jeering. So there you go. I feel Interesting. like those results make perfect sense, at least on the golfer front, because golfers, other than Tiger Woods, because Tiger Woods' dad was always messing with him, you know, for many of the documentaries, they always are used to golfing in complete silence. So that makes sense. Yeah. But uh, I'm, sur I'm not surprised about the basketball players either because, you know, the free throws, everybody's seen, you know, people yelling during the free throws, whether it's for you or against your team. So I think that makes I, sense too. I think that, that that's kind of like rote memory too, or just like motor, use like muscle memory, just like here's how you get the ball in the hoop because it's 15 feet all the time. Like I guess you could say the same thing from Tina from a golf tee as well as a, like a pitcher mound, which is how they did the baseball pitcher. Yeah. I kept thinking about Happy Gilmore the whole time I was reading this article. It's <laughs> 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 pretty funny. I wonder, like, why do you think the baseball pitchers, like, why, why that? That's the only thing that kind of I wouldn't have expected. Have you, have you all ever seen, uh, it, it's, it's worth a YouTube search, but Texas A&M ball five chant. So mm -hmm. the, oh, it's insidious. It's insidious. I wish we had the ability to pull it up right now. But after a four pitch walk, the crowd starts chanting like ball four, ball four. And like the, uh, next batter will get up and they throw a ball again. Be like, ball five, ball five. And they'll go to like ball 11. Like, pitchers throwing the ball into the dugout, into the fence. And, like, it rattles them. And of course, it would. It's the most 
insidious sort of fan behavior you could imagine. It just it rattles them. So like that's that's all I was thinking about. Not Happy Gilmore, but I was thinking about this Texas A and M fan <laughs> behavior. It's it's wild, wild stuff. Uh, this is awesome. I th- I thought the article was really interesting as a starting point. I w- I figure you got to dig deeper. First of all, I love it plays off of Robert Doctor Zients's you know, social facilitation. I said to Charles yeah. when we read it, um, he was my honors thesis uh, class advisor at Michigan. Um, and we used to all, every course in psychology at Michigan, the first article you had to read was his social facilitation article because it was just so perfect about, you know, the impact in one direction or the other direction of having the mere presence of others around him. So I thought that that was really interesting. Um, I think it's a good starting point. I don't know if if we really totally understand it based on the <laughs> article you sent over. I thought it was interesting. And you know, the one thing it brought up in my mind, and I always go into that intelligence stuff, but I remember hearing an O-line uh, guy, I think he played for Seattle, for your team, Charles, um, talking about he was listening to the crowd. Because if the crowd, when he was on the road, if the crowd started to roar, he knew that his yeah. quarterback was going to get sacked. Like he was, he wasn't sitting wow. there getting negatively affected because he was getting stressed about the crowd yelling at him. He was using it as a cognitive input to to know what to do. I mean, it really, you know. So I think people use that kind of thing in different ways and probably react to it in different ways. So. I, I think it's a cool topic. That's for sure. And that's another great example of the game slowing down for a player, right? right? Is yeah. like I'm, when, you know, the, the, the rookie offensive lineman probably isn't consciously aware of what's going on there to use that metacognition to react differently because of that. So that, that's fascinating. Yeah. I, I, maybe on the other end of the spectrum, like uh, when I was a kid playing sports, I, I wouldn't hear the crowd at all. Like just you silence it out. Your brain just shuts that totally down. But I guess I'm not a pro athlete either. Yeah. That's probably your basketball finding, right? They just shut that all out. Right? Yeah. Just yeah. Focus. yeah. That focus. And yeah. that was what the thing I read. Cause like, again, I agree. The study's not like <laughs> that great, but but the thing I think about with it is why aren't, why isn't focus translating across all sports, right? Why is it just in basketball? Why not golf? What, you know, why not the pitcher? Why is ball five even having an effect? Mm-hmm. Like the, the, to me, that, that seems like it should be transferable amongst sports. Yeah. You wonder about something about how they learn the sport. Like I was thinking of tennis when I was reading this too, because People get really upset if there's any movements or talking yeah. that they're trying to serve and can go like uh, get really emotional and go ballistic. But there's something about the learning environment, right? When you golf, it's always quiet. You're outdoors. Basketball, it's always loud, which is why the baseball is so interesting, right? Because it's usually kind of loud always at baseball. Why that would throw them off? I mean, maybe it's you're kind of on a little island by yourself there and it's really kind of helping. It's hurting you from getting into whatever mental space you need to get into. Yeah. Well, we've got, we've got one more nerdery article and I just, when, when academics come on, I always want to talk about something academic in nature as well. And, and so let me pull it up real quick. It's called, what will you do after? And it's from the journal of, of a uh, quarterly journal of experimental psychology. And, and what they do, um, is they, they followed post-psychology PhD graduates to find out where they go in their careers. And the thing I wanted to call out here, first on a personal level, but uh, well, actually I'll start with, they, they, they put an alluvial chart in here, which I'm a huge fan, or they're also sometimes called Sankey charts, uh, that I love giving a call out for any good Sankey chart out there because I feel like they're an underused visualization. <laughs> But second of all, what they find is how many folks that go pursue psychology PhDs end up in non-academic positions. And so I, on a personal level, I get asked all the time by people who are thinking of going and getting a PhD because I guess they presume the only career option after that is to go into academia. And you look at this, and I don't have the exact numbers on here, but on the alluvial chart, I mean, it looks like probably only one out of five people getting their psychology PhD actually goes into academia. 
many go into non-academic roles and the biggest of which they, is this category they called academic adjacent, which is things like research, outreach, industry research, policy work, that type of thing. And then there's other folks that is probably the second biggest category, but still considerably smaller, which are in the skill transfer area, doing things like data science and project management and that type of thing. But I, for Harold and Charles, for you guys, I mean, you, you've got your own graduate students. Does this track with your experience of the folks that are coming through your PhD program? Yeah, we really enjoyed reading it just for that reason. I'm like, this is IO psychology when I was looking at it. And it's interesting as you think about the data science track, that's something that's radically grown, you know, for people in our field, um, you know, so at some point, maybe things will flip where that's going to be one of the larger parts of that graph. But you know, we always love that, you know, it's not in this opportunity that there's things that we would have never thought an IO would have done and somebody gets an opportunity to do it. Yeah, I agree with Charles, the idiosyncratic nature of careers and and where you end up is one aspect of it the other aspect is that you know we talk about it as research but it's really think about the things we do we're learning how to predict outcomes i mean that's a really broad space you could go work at microsoft and try and help predict outcomes you could go work in so many different functions not within hr you could go work within marketing within other areas and so you know, teams and how people interact and get along. I mean, you know, that's that's got such broad applicability way outside of even HR within companies, right? And so there's that aspect of it as well. Um, we, we told like PhD students, like you can go out and do whatever you want, but like part of that is just knowing what's out there in the first place, right? And that's, that's what I like about this. It provides a good description of the various um, subfields that you can go into. And uh, so you, you can at least read about it, like get a good sense of what they are. And whenever I talk to uh, kids in grad school, I tell them that, to be very critical about your own skills and what you want out of life and what you enjoy doing, really, because once you're in it, you are in it, right? So if, if you don't enjoy teaching, <laughs> there, there's other tracks for you. You know, if you do enjoy teaching, by all means, go for it. But there's other things that you can do. And uh, like, like, like Tears for Fears, they said, like, everybody wants to rule the world. Maybe not everyone can be like the CEO of a company because that takes like a different sort of skill set, even though everyone's kind of like pushed to be like you know, grow up the ladder, this sort of thing. Uh, but I, I, I love that it provides a snapshot in a qualitative fashion of the descriptions of the various things that you can do. Because like to your point, it's our skills are fungible to a lot of different areas. There's a lot of ways we can uh, utilize them. And, yeah. and it, it tells you also to be very don't read just within our field. You know, yeah. don't stay up on yeah. things just within our field. Read across, you know, all these different things. Stay open to other things because you just never know where you'll see that connection, you know. Um, so, I, I mean, I maybe it's just a way to rationalize reading. No. People magazine and Rolling Stone, but I'm just saying no, you no, got to no. stay, you got to stay kind of out there because you'll see where things integrate and you'll get that interdisciplinary outcome um, or approach, you know, that might really open up new doors and, and new ways of thinking. Some of the oldest IO research is uh, consumer research, right? right. Uh, applying to the consumer. For, and yeah. We've kind of gotten away from that or like yeah. limited ourselves in some respects, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you just. If you replace the word research with the word science, you know, you're just yeah. doing science and science mm -hmm. cuts across all disciplines, right? So it's Absolutely. really important to stay aware across all of those things. Once you've got that toolkit, you can answer just about any type of question. Yeah. Your creativity, it's the only thing that would limit you. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we're right. I think we use terms that make it sound so narrow. But we're yeah. trying to understand human behavior. We're trying to understand outcome. Yeah. We're trying to make connections of what will predict what will occur. You know, if I said those things out loud, nobody would even know that IO psych is what I'm talking about. I mean, they're, they're very broad things. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives us a lot of opportunities, which is cool because, you know, there's a lot of fun things to do out there. You guys going to PSYOP? Getting, getting pumped for PSYOP? Yeah, all what right. about you all? Oh, yeah. yeah. You got the live show during PSYOP, right? Excited for that. Come on down. Come on down. 
Yeah, we can't stop talking about it. You know, it's like <laughs> all we talk about nowadays. <laughs> I feel like it's just shameless self promotion at this point, but who cares? Um, well, I mean, what kind of music are you guys into? Like, I heard from a little birdie that uh, you might be in, uh, Deadheads. Certainly, uh, certainly, yep. We've spent our time around the Grateful Dead music. Uh, Charles and I like outlaw country a little bit also. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, yeah, we've always enjoyed music. One, one thing that just happened to happen was our team all liked music, other than Kenny. Although he's always willing to come along, so it's great. So Thank we've you. definitely connected over that. And uh, whenever we're on the road for work, we try and make it intersect with being able to catch some music. So. And yeah. being in New York City is great for that since everybody comes through here. And so we try to find who's going to be the next up and coming thing at some small venue in New York. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> how, many, how, many, how, many, uh, ice cream. how many dead shows have y'all seen? Uh, you're going to. I, I saw The Dead only once in 94. Okay. And then I've seen Dead and Company, but Harold's answer is going to blow your mind. Well, I don't know about blow your mind, but no, uh, closer to 100. Yeah. And a lot of them were with a buddy of mine I met in grad school back at Maryland, Eric, Eric Braverman. We bonded over The Dead and uh, found ways to see them without missing too many classes. So that was a positive. I, I would say it's like a power law distribution with deadheads, but I mean, like even a hundred doesn't sound that high from some of the it totals really I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> it really isn't. But uh, it was a good cross section. <laughs> yeah, those deadheads just got to keep on trucking, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> they oh, they seem to be they 30. seem to be everywhere. I bet you there's a it'd be a good thing to figure out with Psyop. I bet you there's a lot of <laughs> deadheads there. <laughs> I bet you there are. Let's start yeah. a group. <laughs> if there aren't enough already. Well, guys, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. I've been so thrilled to, to have you involved here and acknowledge our, our friend of the podcast, Alan Kamen, for making the introduction. So thanks, Alan. Right. But uh, Scott, any final words for our guests uh, oh, before we let him go? I, I, I'm just an armchair quarterback. And I, you know, it, it seems like it's easy as picking out a, a shirt for a toddler, you know, from your armchair. But it's it's great to see you guys like actually doing this and it's it's super fascinating we could we could talk for another hour love to have you guys on again absolutely we really enjoyed this this was great thank you thanks to alan for for connecting us and uh and this was just a great conversation we really appreciate it yeah and thanks for doing your work with the podcast this is really a great resource for our field uh, i i love this is what i listen to when i run in the morning so you know we really appreciate the good work you guys are doing Oh, you poor thing. I'm so sorry. No, no, you get me, you get me thinking, and uh, it's great. See, I um, listen to the dead, and he listens to the podcast. That's the way it works. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you've been listening to Direction and Correct, a People Analytics podcast with Colin Scott and today's guests, Harold Goldstein and Charles Sherbaum. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I'd like to say a big thank you to our first few patrons of the podcast, Max Blumberg, Nicole Ledich, and Reed Bramble. Thanks so much for your contributions to making the podcast possible. If you'd like to learn more about how to be a patron, keep listening now. Direction and Correct is dedicated to you, our listeners, to help educate and entertain you on how to effectively do people analytics. By supporting this podcast, you're helping us continue to provide valuable insights and knowledge to our listeners. Please consider becoming a patron of the podcast. You can find the link to sign up in the show notes or at patron.podbean.com slash directionally correct. Thanks for your support.